Hey everyone, welcome to Watch It Play Table Talk Back. My name is Rodney Smith and this is Pet McDonald. And in this episode, we'll be looking at your responses to the topic of what causes you to buy a game. Yeah, what causes you to take that money to your wallet, throw it on the counter and say, I'm taking it home with me. Let's dive right in. Well, our first comment came from Racer Drago who said, I think of how much I'll be able to play the game based on what its replay value is. Now that's something we didn't mention, but replay value is something I think people consider. That's true. I mean, I think most games are replayable on some level, unless it's a legacy game, you know. Or a bad one. Or a bad, <laughs> or a bad game, that's true. <laughs> but some games definitely uh, lend more replayability in that they have maybe variable setup. Mm. Uh, when you play the game, you don't work through all the cards in a deck, so there's stuff to go back and explore. So I can see that being a factor that someone's going to consider. How many times can I replay this and get sort of a new experience from it each time? The Risk Taker 3 wrote, a lot of things, actually. <laughs> I'm just picking one of the items out of his excellent commentary on this. And there's lots of great comments people that we can't you know, obviously feature here in this video. So feel free to go back and check the comments section for them. But he said, one factor is the rarity of a game. Coming from games like Monopoly or even video games, you can take for granted how easy it is to acquire many of those games. Once I started getting back into board games, I realized they're not always available forever. This can be because of limited print runs, publishers losing their rights, and so on. This is why I'm very mindful of what games are in short supply, and I may pull the trigger based on that. Hmm. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah, there's lots of games I can think of, especially with Kickstarter as an example, where right. it's something that you might not have a chance to demo it, you might not have a chance to, to see much of what's going on in the game, but you know that you have to buy it. This is the only chance you're gonna get to, to get that, yeah. Yeah, if so it if you don't buy it, you're not gonna get it later. Right. Now, of course, a lot of games that are popular, um, they might go to print for a certain period of time, but then eventually they will get reprinted. So you don't always want to feel a strict sense of that, but I think around Kickstarter especially, mm. they, they might not sell enough initially to really warrant doing it again, right? So sometimes that's where a print and play version of the game can come in handy, where you can sort of try the game out in advance that way if you're not able to get an actual live demo of it. That's true. Patrick Doss writes, gaming conventions such as Gen Con and Origins are great for allowing people to try before they buy. First-hand experiences are great for helping to decide buy a game. I agree, I think a first-hand experience is always <laughs> pretty foolproof. Yeah, if you um, can get to one, going to a convention is a great idea because you're gonna get to experience so much. Yeah, it's not the cheapest way to get a demo, um, but if you have one in your local area that you can attend, I, it's, it's a great experience. I mean, I've always enjoyed the conventions I've gone to. Yeah, I mean, if you're only trying to demo one game, probably don't go to Gen Con for that. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> but uh, if you have multiple things you want to try to do, that's a good idea. Yeah, I think conventions are a great way to try out games. Kenny Good now says, I'm really surprised you did not mention the publisher or designer as consideration. <laughs> I'm surprised we didn't mention it either. I know. <laughs> don't know how we forgot that. But Netter's Play has a video that talks about that right now. Oh, let's go check it out. Hello everyone, my name's Annette, and you might know me on social media as Netter's Plays. Some of the reasons that I purchase a game is because of the designer. If it's a designer that I really like and enjoy, then more than likely I'm going to be interested in that game. I might go on BGG, or I also look at other content creators, uh, reviewers as well, and see you know, what appeals and see the game played on the table and how it's played and such. So I, I tend to do a lot of research. But then again, there's also the Kickstarters that pop up here and there, or when I go to a friendly game store and the game is right on the shelf and I just want to get it right then and there. So, <laughs> I mean, there's always like the research that I put into these games, but then there's also the instant gratification too of purchasing a game right then and there. So thanks for watching. I'll talk to you all later. Bye. Expanding on that is Andrew Smith who says, if it's a designer I love, I will almost always buy. If it's illustrated by an artist I like, I will always give it a really close look. And if it's by a company whose games I often like, I will consider it. Yeah, I thought that was an interesting point because the more I play more games, the more I do start to pay attention to the artists, for example. Mm. Uh, designer, yeah, I usually pay attention to that, but artistry is also something that draws me into a game. So Ian O'Toole's name or Beth Sobel, Beth Sobel yeah. right? these are artists that I like the artwork. I, I'm kind of curious about games that have their art involved. And uh, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce it, Naide, the uh, artist oh, from Takaido and, yeah. and many other games. Right. And it, it's funny because, yes, yeah, so many people love the art in certain games, but probably don't know who the artist is. The artist is. Yeah, because yeah. their names aren't usually as prominently displayed on a cover, if at all. You'd have to go digging a little bit to find it. 
Pablo Espinosa says, I think the theme and components aren't just a superficial element, because the theme makes the games understandable for people. In your mind, it's easier to internalize something if you can relate it to something you already know. I agree. You know, I, I wanted to put this comment in there because during our Table Talk episode, I think I made the comment that theme, artwork, these are superficial things. And I wanted to be clear <laughs> that I'm not saying they aren't without value. They have a lot of value, especially like, as you said, Pablo, the theme, tying the ideas together, giving you a context for why you're doing these game mechanics. I think what I really meant in that was just even if the components are the best components ever and the artwork is amazing, if the gameplay and design fall short of what you're looking for, I think even despite all those other things being perfect, it's less likely that game will come down to the table. Yeah. But without good artwork and all those things, a great design is diminished. I yeah, think. it's so true. And, and I totally agree with Pablo too because once you have confidence in a certain thing, like I'm very confident about space games. Yes. So if I pick up a new space game, I just, I have that drive to learn it, I have that drive to understand it, and when I'm talking about laser beams and shields and, <laughs> right. and building a the ship. The really speaks to you. Yeah, yeah like yeah. It, it could have been a pirate ship instead and it would have had the same things worded differently, yes. but yeah. Tony, if Tony writes, because of the I like the game but nobody else does situation. I almost exclusively buy games that have a solo variant. And I thought that was good because we did talk about player count, but not really the importance of solo play for some people. Oh, it's so true. I don't find I'm really uh, the kind of person who plays a solo game. I'll tend, if I want to play something solo, to play something on the, the computer, maybe right. even play a board game that way right. against computers. But yeah, so it's a lot of people do really enjoy solo gaming. Right, because they want an actual board game experience, so they want to be moving pieces around, have a board, cards, or whatever, right? So again, having that solo option for some people is really going to appeal. Kaiser Blade says, sometimes a discount or huge sale motivates me to buy. Yeah, we also talked about price, but a big sale is an interesting factor. I know Fantasy Flight Games around Christmas usually has a big blowout sale of a lot of their games. And sometimes that will motivate me to buy the game, not just because of the price point, but because, wow, it's such a deal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll actually, that's a comment I generally make, is if something's 90% off, I'll almost always buy it. And that reminds me of the time uh, neither of us are into the, the WoW TCG, right. but I remember the time you went to a, to a comic book store, <laughs> yeah, that's right. and they had it on sale for 90% off. So oh. you came home with this armful of, like, <laughs> so much dungeons and decks and, and packs, boosters and, <laughs> and it was like $40. Right, if that, it was ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Sebastian Trost wrote, Sometimes I read the manual, <laughs> which was a smaller part of a larger comment. What he was getting at there was sometimes in advance of buying the game, he'll read the manual. Of course. Yeah, to get a sense of, you know, maybe through looking at the game mechanics, will I like this? Oftentimes the manual will show you a lot of the artwork as well in the game. Yeah, a lot of times you can find like the PDF online, which is, mm. I'll, I'll do that occasionally. Yeah, I think it's great that the publishers now do release almost always their rule books online before the game's even available. Peter Mobius adds, my buy decisions come more easily because I feel that almost all games maintain a high resale value. If I can turn around and sell a $60 game I just bought for $45, it makes buying not as difficult. Hmm. I think there are certainly some games that retain their value. I think collectible games kind of get, <laughs> they're the easy one, like Magic the Gathering, right? Certain cards are going to be quite high value. I think it depends kind of on your local area and the market there. I don't have a lot of places I could go to sell my games unless it was directly to a friend. Um, You'd mostly be selling online and have to deal with paying for the shipping. Right. If I was in a larger metropolitan area, it might be easier to find locations just to go and sell, sell games to and from. But certainly if, if you buy a game on Kickstarter and had some like Kickstarter exclusives, I think those can not only retain their value, they can excel, exceed their values. I saw copies of Blood Rage going for more than what it cost to originally buy it because they included these exclusives that you couldn't find. That's kind of uh, touching on the great sale part too. I mean, you find a great sale. You might yes. be able to resell that game for more than you bought it for, right. period. <laughs> exactly. Well, listen, before we go on to the next one, I just want to play a clip that I think will tie into it. So let's take a look. Hi, Rodney. Hi, Pep. I'm Gabby, and this is my dad, Gil. Hello there. I guess the question this week is, why do we keep buying board games? That's a very difficult question. Why do we keep buying board games? I'm not sure why we keep buying board games, but we had, a, we had board games we've had for so long we didn't even open them. I'm yeah. not sure why we weren't able to. We couldn't wait to get our hands on the game and now they're sitting on the shelf. I always want to have new things on my faithful bag to take to our game group and uh, I just a collection of things. I just love board games. I love, love, love. What about you? I love them too. Yeah. Well, I guess it's just a little compulsion. Are you going to keep buying board games when you grow up? I think so. Yeah. I guess 
it's gonna run into family. See you guys, thank you. See ya. Boy, can I relate to that video when I first saw it. Because yes, playing games is fun, but there was an aspect of the hobby at one point where acquiring new games was this kind of fun as well. Seeing my collection grow is kind of a representation of my obsession with the hobby. And Mark Cook writes a little bit about this as well. He said, I started out getting the latest and greatest of everything that was out. Then I hit a valley of despair when I realized I couldn't get everything. And most people will hit some kind of a wall that means their collection will have to stop or at least drastically slow in its expanding. I then came out on the other side where I realized I didn't need everything. There's just so much depth in the hobby compared to others because even playing the same game multiple times gives you different experiences because of the people that you're playing with. And I think that's one of the differences in our hobby compared to other forms of entertainment. Yes, you could watch the same movie that you love and enjoy over and over again and, and discover new things. And same with books. But I think games are really intentionally meant to be played over and over and over again. Discover new strategies, discover new components, new things that you didn't get to the first time you played, right? Yeah, and the average person isn't going to watch a movie seven times in a row. No, no. But exactly. you get a new game, you might actually sit down and just... You can't play it multiple times in a row. You certainly yeah. would be... I think that would be the expectation that you're going to buy a game and get to play it more than one time. Unless it's a legacy game, maybe. Yeah, and I mean, I, I always just kind of have a sense of dread when it comes to buying and, and purchasing and acquiring <laughs> oh, new dread. games. dread? Well, it's Tell just, me. you never know whether you're going to actually get a chance to play it. You have to find room for it. Mm. I'll probably have to get rid of something else to make room for this new game that's coming in. There are practical concerns about getting new games, right? Shelf space and things yeah. like that. Like, it literally does become an issue at a certain point, right? Yeah, and you just you worry about the disappointment that the game might cause, whether mm -hmm. or not your friends are going to enjoy it. There's just so many things to think about every time I pick up a new game. <laughs> I feel like we need to have a talk afterwards about <laughs> your dread over board games. <laughs> we'll help Pep work through this. Tom Judd writes, something that definitely draws my attention is if a game comes out in a second edition, or if the game has clear roots in another game, but develops and improves the original game system. Oh, this, this so much. This is the one cure to my dread. Oh! And my despair. <laughs> We're getting to the cure already. <laughs> All right, why is that? Well, it's just, whenever a game comes out, and I, as I mentioned, I'm not sure if I'm going to enjoy it, maybe there's going to be some problems with mm. the game. So a second edition of a game is so great because it's already improving upon components. Like, look at Robinson Crusoe, for example. Right, right. The difference between the first and second edition is night and day. Yeah, I would almost recommend a person never buy the first edition. Get the second edition, for sure. No. And like I don't in, normally recommend games. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And some games, the second edition isn't that much of a change. It's yeah. slight artwork change or something, but in many, it, it's a big difference. Well, can I point out like a game like, um, oh, Mansions of Madness second edition, for example, right? They introduced an app. That's quite mm. a departure from the first game. And in the first edition, uh, some would have said that the setup is prone to making errors, which can kind of break the gameplay. And this kind of removes all of that. And a lot of the more fiddly parts are removed. So the game is streamlined. So if you already like the first edition, warts and all, a second edition, right, is you're going to have a little more confidence that this is maybe even a better version of something I already like. Yeah, and I mean, I also love the idea of waiting for a collector's edition, too, because if a game comes out mm. with a nice custom wooden box and components or something like that, yeah, I yeah. want to buy that, and I want to buy it before I've bought the original game. I don't want to buy... Two copies. <laughs> I don't want two copies. I, <laughs> yeah, I want to sure. buy the, the really good copy before I had even decided to buy it. Starling UK adds, if it says Spiel de Jars on the box, I'm more than likely to buy it. Okay, so Spiel de Jars is an award. And that, I thought that was a good point. Because sometimes, yes, if you're looking at a shelf of games, you're like, oh, I could buy any one of these five games. If one of them has a prestigious award attached to it, that might be a motivation to pick up that game. It's very true. Game of the Year, Spiel de Jars, anything like that. Mensa Select. Right. Watch it played. Watch it played. <laughs> <laughs> never know. No, but I think, uh, well, with the Spiel de Jars, I think they've said, like, as soon as you get that award, you can expect to sell thousands more copies than you might have otherwise. So awards can have an impact. Julian Grenier writes, I only buy games recommended by Rodney on his secret channel where he gives nothing but opinions about <laughs> games. There is no such channel like that. Or is there? No, there isn't. There is, there is no such channel as that. But I thought that was We'll funny. leave a link in the description <laughs> there's below. No, there's no link there for that. I'll leave it. <laughs> Lori McKenzie writes, For me, the most helpful thing I ever did was to learn who I was as a gamer. It's a lot easier to make decisions about what games you'd like to buy. Once you understand the types of themes, game mechanics, and styles of games that you really enjoy. I'm not saying you shouldn't play things outside of your comfort level. Play all the games. But understanding your likes and dislikes goes a long way towards cutting through the myriad of choices on the store shelf. So true. I thought that was a great sort of one to end here, and there's lots of great comments that people made. But that one is, I think understanding yourself and what you really like can help you make those decisions. The best example I've had that recently is my wife. I'm often trying to introduce games to her for my collection, and 
she recently said, I think, Rodney, I'm a Eurogamer. She played enough games to get a sense of the things that she likes in them, and now she actually has a higher interest in playing games because she knows the styles that she, she likes. So when she's looking at my game shelf, she goes, oh, that one's a Euro game? Yeah, I want to try that one out. Right? As opposed to me just hitting her with some other game that, I don't know if I'm going to like this or not. She has a sense of what she likes. Yeah, and I mean, I think everybody should probably try to, to always try to expand and try new things, but mm. definitely, you know, find your, your speciality, your focus, um, especially in a game group. It's very helpful to have one person who's a little bit more of a heavy party gamer, one who's more into war games, somebody else who likes the storytelling games more, because right. then these people will bring those to the table and help everyone. Kind of advocate for them too, right? Yeah. So, yeah no, I, so again, lots of great suggestions in there. Please go back and put in the, check the old comments that we had in the video. If you want to add some new things that we missed, because I was really surprised. I thought we covered a lot of the things. Oh, and then, so much more added. There was so much more that you guys added. You might have even more things, so feel free to put them in the comments below. But until the next episode, thanks, thanks for, for watching. watching.